Hello and welcome to Live Wire Markets. I'm Ali Selby, and today we're lucky enough to be sitting down with Mary Manning, who, after nine years with Elliston Capital, has nabbed a role at Alfinity Investment Management. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mary. Thank you for having me, Albie. It's a pleasure to be here. As I just mentioned there, you've just started at Alfinity. What inspired the shift to sustainable investment management? Well, I would say two things. First of all, I think that sustainable investment is, is where the world is going. And you know, nobody wants to be invested in unsustainable uh, companies. And one of the things I really like about the way that Alfinity looks at ESG and sustainability is that it's, it's quite broad. So sustainability for the um, domestic sustainable share fund and for the global sustainable fund, which is um, the fund that I'm involved with, they look at sustainability in terms of the sustainable development goals. So that is very interesting. It's a very broad alignment. It's not some a sustainable fund that just wants to invest in green stocks and, and that's it. So I think, you know, I'm Canadian, as you know, and Wayne Gretzky is one of the most famous Canadian hockey players. And one of his most famous quotes is, you want to skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck has been. And when I look at the investment landscape, I think that sustainability is where the puck is going. And I think global is where the puck is going. So to have the ability to work for a global sustainable fund is, is really uh, important to me. Uh, the second thing that I will add is that from a personal perspective, um, you know, sustainable investing really aligns with my personal value system. I recently did a course with the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership, which if anyone has some time on their hands during lockdown, I highly recommend. And they actually take you through quantitatively in a, in, um, in a certain quantitative scoring card, like why you care about sustainability. And for me, you know, there were some very specific personal alignments which was quite illuminating because it's like, oh, that's why I care about sustainability. So for me, it's the alignment of uh, professional and, and personal um, opportunities and values. And I'm really excited to be at Alfinity. Okay, Mary, in your previous role, you really focused on emerging markets and Asian equities. I'd love to ask, with the fresh regulatory changes in China, do you still see opportunity in that region? As your readers and your viewers will know, it's a very, very difficult time in China right now. And I would say that the reasons why it's difficult are, are multifold. First of all, this regulatory crackdown is not just in one sector. We've seen that before. You know, a few years ago, there was sort of a crackdown on online gaming and companies like Tencent or NetEase were not getting games approved. You've certainly seen in the past crackdowns on the real estate sector or, you know, on, on gaming in Macau. But the thing about this regulatory reset is that it is ubiquitous. It is across every single sector. And it's not even from a financial perspective. It's across every single aspect of, of Chinese society. So from a portfolio management perspective, and certainly from a stock picking perspective, there's kind of nowhere to hide in other regulatory crackdowns. You know, if it was in one sector, you could just reposition your portfolio elsewhere. But that is not an option in this crackdown. And I think that's a very big challenge for investing in China overall. I think the second thing is that um, there is very little visibility in terms of the timing for this, this regulatory reset, which is what it's dubbed as. So if you look back, I mentioned before sort of the, the crackdown on gaming that lasted for maybe a year, 18 months. If you look back to the, the crackdown on graft, which happened right after President Xi came in for his first term, that lasted for about three years. Or certainly if you look way back in, in time, you know, the Cultural Revolution lasted for a really long time. So when people are looking at this regulatory reset in China, it's hard to tell whether um, you know, we're 10 months in and this is only gonna last for 12 months or whether this is gonna last for many years. So the combination of those two things, the ubiquitous nature across all sectors and the fact that the timing could be quite prolonged, I think makes it quite difficult to invest in China right now. That said, when all the dust settles, there are certainly going to be some very, very good buying opportunities um, in, in large tech. These are some of the, the um, best run companies in the, in the world and certainly the largest companies in China. Also in consumer, I think there's gonna be some really good opportunities, but um, it, I think that right now it's still a little bit in falling knife territory and a little bit too early to step in, particularly for a global fund that doesn't have to have exposure to China. Are there any emerging market companies that you believe should have a place in every global portfolio? Yeah, so as you know, I'm a very strong believer in emerging markets because I feel very strongly that that um, structural growth story in emerging markets is, is very attractive. And um, I also think, getting back to your earlier question about sustainability, a lot of the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, were initially designed for emerging market companies. If you look at our countries, if you look at the first five goals, they're about reduction in poverty and ending hunger and health and well-being and 
gender equality, uh, education. These are thematics which are playing out in a much more obvious way in emerging markets. So I think that um, you know, for, for a global fund, there's a lot of really interesting sustainable ideas in developed markets, and there's also interesting ideas in emerging markets. The companies that I would highlight in emerging markets, there's some in China and some in India, and then some you know, elsewhere in emerging markets. One of the companies that we hold in the Global Sustainable Fund at Alfinity is Mercado Libre, which is sort of like the Alibaba of, of Latin America, but it's, it's not just e-commerce, they've moved into payments and they're really sort of democratizing a lot of things in Latin America, whether that's consumption or whether that's you know, financial inclusion. So I would highlight as the, that as a, a really amazing company. Um, India, as you know, is, is, a, is a massive economy. It's gonna be one of the top three economies in the world by 2030. And there are some very high quality companies in India, which I think are, are interesting. Um, certainly HDFC and HDFC Bank on the finance side and the financial inclusion angle for those companies is, is quite interesting. Some of the IT services companies, which are best in class, Infosys and, and TCS. And then Reliance from a sustainability perspective, obviously the energy business is, is not particularly sustainable, but that company is gonna get broken up into three different companies. And when it does, I think the telecom piece and the retail piece uh, look, look very interesting. The other thing I'll mention that is some of the smaller emerging markets like Indonesia, um, there are a lot of unicorns popping up, but Singapore would be another example. And so I think not right now, but maybe you know two to three years from now, once these unicorns have listed and they are profitable and they have a really good track record of being listed companies, um, they're going to be sort of uh, must own or certainly must look at companies in emerging markets. Is the approach to ESG different in emerging markets than it would be in global markets? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's one of the things that I really like about Alfinity and one of the reasons why, why I'm excited to be uh, involved with the firm is that the, the process, the ESG process and the, um, the structure of aligning companies' revenues and, and their business operations with the sustainable development goals is applicable across markets. It's applicable across different sectors. Um, and so it's a very structured and consistent way to look at companies. And I think that's important for a global fund because you can't have double standards or triple standards based on you know, where a company is, is operating. And so I think the things that are different is that disclosure in developed markets is much better. And even within developed markets, there's, there's um, you know, considerable differentials. So Japan, for example, disclosure on ESG and sustainability is still uh, pretty bad, whereas Europe is obviously leading the world in terms of some of those issues. Uh, I think in emerging markets, the, the thing is, is that the ability to improve on disclosure and ESG and sustainability is, is much more than it would be in Europe, say, which is already at a very high level. And as we discussed before, in terms of alignment with the SDGs, there is um, sort of a more obvious scope for alignment in some of the emerging market uh, countries. So putting that all together for a global portfolio, I guess I'll sum it up by saying that there are opportunities everywhere. In your new role, you're focusing on communications and technology. I'd like to know, are the FANG stocks considered to be sustainable? This is a great question, Ali. It's a, it's a question that I get a lot. Um, so I guess the first point is that all FANGs are not created equally. There is, a, there is a big difference between the sustainability and ESG of Microsoft versus Facebook. And just because they're, they're FANGs or whatever acronym it is that includes Microsoft these days, you know, let's call them the, big, the US big tech companies. Just because you're a big tech, big tech company does not mean that you should be lumped into the same um, bucket in terms of ESG and sustainability. So um, we've actually developed a matrix at Alfinity that looks at the, the big tech companies on, on those two metrics, sustainability, do they align with sustainable development goals? And then ESG on ESNG, are they, um, you know, what are their practices? Are they best practices or are they severely lacking in practices? And when you do that sort of analysis, as, as I mentioned before, there's a large divergence. So you have companies like Microsoft and Apple um, that are highly aligned with sustainable development goals. For starters, um, you know, in terms of environmental sustainability, they're both asset light um, business models with digital, not so much Apple, but um, you know, digital supply chains. And they, the Apple business model means that there's, there's not that much of an of a environmental footprint. Um, and then you have companies like Amazon, which are sort of in the, in the middle. They do have a lot of goods, the SDG 12, which is about production and consumption. They're both positive and negatives there with respect to, to Amazon. And then in the bottom left corner, which is companies that have both poor ESG and do not align with sustainable development goals are companies like Facebook. 
So they, I mean, the, the ESG issues at Facebook and with respect to Mark Zuckerberg and privacy and antitrust are, are very well known to the market. And then from a sustainability perspective, they're not like, you know, Apple or Google, uh, you know, for anyone who has kids knows that kids in lockdown, they're spending all day on Google classrooms. And, you know, we're spending all day on Microsoft Teams and a lot of you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that those big tech companies do which align with sustainable development goals, whereas spending time on Facebook or, you know, WhatsApp, those are not necessarily aligning to any of the SDGs. I'm surprised that Amazon is kind of in that middle range just because there's been quite a lot of publicity about, I guess, its treatment of its workers. I, I guess I'd really like to know a bit more about how Amazon fits in the, <laughs> the, the middle of the being sustainable and not being so great. Yeah, so I guess um, first I'll, I'll talk about ESG and then we can talk about the, the sustainable part. So on ESG, you need to remember that um, Google and certainly Facebook, they have dual shareholding structures. And so there's a big differential between the economic ownership and the voting power. So from an ESG perspective, and Facebook is in the, the worst category here because Mark Zuckerberg is obviously still involved in the day to day and he also has you know significant voting control. Those companies are sort of, um, you know, certainly Facebook is in a class of its own in terms of having that ESG challenge, whereas Amazon doesn't. It's a single share shareholder structure and, um, you know, Jeff Bezos is actually, you know, no longer the CEO and does have an economic interest, but it's not disproportionate. Um, it's not disproportionate and there's not a disproportionate voting interest. So that's the main point on, um, on ESG. On sustainability, uh, I think that the main thing for, for Amazon is that there have been issues with, with, or certainly issues that have been in the press with respect to treatment of workers. And the gig economy and sustainability is actually a really big thought piece, which um, you know I'm working on right now because it's not specific to Amazon. It's Uber, it's Lyft, it's Meituan in China, it's um, you know Zwiggy in India. Like this is just uh, uh, the gig economy and the impact on younger generations, millennial or Gen Z, and, and how that's changing how they work is actually a, a big piece of work that people still need to get their, get their heads around. So we did a lot of work on this with respect to Amazon, and um, it, it is better than a lot of peers. Amazon is, is a company which is, at the current time, not in the sustainability portfolio for that, for that reason, but it's certainly something that we are watching, and as they make improvements, it may become eligible to be in the, um, in the sustainable portfolio. You mentioned earlier that Microsoft and Apple are kind of the winners in the sustainable and ESG spheres. What do you see as the role of technology in moving towards, I guess, a sustainable future? Yes, another fantastic question, because when people think about technology and sustainability, they often just think about the fangs. And that, that is the, the you know, sort of overlap in their mind between tech and sustainability. But uh, I've done a lot of work looking at technology as an enabler. For, for sustainable um, companies and for sustainable development. And in a way that's actually even more powerful from a sustainable story than just looking at, you know, whether Microsoft aligns with the SDGs or not. So if you look at across different sectors, how is technology enabling a move toward the more sustainable future? Um, you know, financials is a, is a fantastic example because I mentioned HDFC and HDFC Bank before in India, their digitization strategies and the hundreds of millions of people that they can reach via FinTech is something that would just be impossible um, with, without technology. Um, the company I mentioned before, which is in the sustainable portfolio Mercado Libre, I mean, the, the democratization of, of certainly payments and consumption in Latin America and being able to um, you know, access people in, in lower income communities and certainly in lower income countries, um, you know, that's only uh, available because of, of, um, because of technology. Uh, in terms of education, you see like online education and the ability for to use technology to deliver education and to deliver services like healthcare in areas or uh, of, of developed countries, or certainly in developing countries that wouldn't otherwise get that. You know, technology is, is significantly enabling. The last sector that I'll call out is agriculture. So we own deer, which is a leader. I mean, everybody knows what deer is, but people often don't know that deer is a is a leader in terms of precision ag tech. And you know, if you think about what that can do over time in terms of uh, helping farmers and aligning with SDG2, which is um, and ending hunger, then you know, that's very powerful. So um, yeah, I would encourage your, your readers and your listeners, when you're thinking about technology and sustainability, it's not just, do I like Facebook or not? Or you know, do I like Microsoft or not? It's what is technology as a driving force 
doing to um, you know, enable other countries and other companies to become more sustainable in their operations. Mary, I'd like to know how you approach investing in this new role. I know that Alfinity doesn't invest in the classic green names that you would see in sustainable portfolios. Why is that? Yes, okay. Uh, I think a very, very important point to highlight about Alfinity and for investors to be aware of when they're looking at different sustainable or ESG investment options is what is the main point? Is the main point just to get exposure to green things and you know green investments and make people feel better about themselves and their investments? Or is the point to have good investments which are also sustainable? And I think a differentiating factor of Alfinity is that the investment case has to be there. That we are not just gonna invest in companies simply because they're sustainable and they look good on your top 10 and they tell a good story about sustainability. In every single investment that's in the portfolio, the investment case has to be there. And so one of the struggles, frankly, is that a lot of the companies, whether it's, um, you know, renewables is probably the best example, is that they, they're a good story and everybody knows that the energy transition is happening and that it has to happen and it has to happen quicker if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement um, stipulations. But a lot of these companies are, are just not attractive investments. I mean, if you, if you go back to sort of classic MBA, Porter's Five Forces sort of analysis, um, there's either very low barriers to entry. This is part of the reason why the entire solar industry, particularly in China, is just not a good investment because there's very low barriers to entry. Or there's um, you know, extremely high barriers to entry and extremely high regulation. If you look at some of the wind companies in, in Europe, they're in that basket. Um, so when we go through like a lot of the, the traditional renewables or, or sort of green companies, they just don't stack up from an earnings perspective. And Alfinity, as you may know, the, the whole investment process is based on earnings leadership. And so, you know, having a, a nice trajectory of, of earnings increases and, and beating and raising with respect to expectations. And the problem with a lot of renewable stocks certainly is that um, either earnings are going down or, you know, they're going up slightly, but they keep missing because of, of different indicators. And so, yeah, it is a challenge to invest there. I think where we found um, more interesting ideas on the sort of green space is in um, industrials. So industrials have played a very important role with respect to energy transition, which sort of gets overlooked by the more obvious stories in renewables. So Schneider Electric is a French company, which we own, which is an, an absolute leader in terms of um, energy transition. And it's, it's, it's certainly a green stock, but it's not maybe an obvious one. Mary, I'd really like to know where you're seeing risk at the moment. Uh, across LiveWire at the moment, everyone's writing about inflation. Is there a risk that we don't see inflation at all and we kind of see the Japanification of markets? Um, th this is a great question. As you say, everybody is trying to figure it out because, um, you know, COVID really put the whole world uh, at, at zero interest rates and most of the developed countries, not just at the zero bound, but certainly in QE. And so, I, I don't have a strong view, you know, inflation or stagflation is also a, a term which has cropped up in the last few weeks. So I think that the biggest er the, the biggest risk is actually policy error. And that this is very tricky for everybody. It's it's tricky for us, it's tricky for your, your readers and your viewers, it's tricky for Jerome Powell, it's you know, it's tricky <laughs> for bankers around the world. And so I think that the biggest risk is that there's there's a policy mistake. And certainly from, from a global perspective and in the US, that, that mistake could be twofold right now from a macro perspective. One could be that the, you know, they're, they're too worried about choking off growth and they, they continue to be worried about um, second or third or fourth waves of COVID and so keep interest rates too low too long. And then the, the, the alternative risk is just that, um, you know, start reducing taper and raising interest rates too fast. And that just chokes the economy off and then uh, yeah, the US gets stuck at the zero bound forever. And that's your comment about Japanification is very fair in that sort of outcome that, you know, the big economies of the world are just cannot get off the zero bound. So um, yes, to the specific answer to your question is I think the biggest risk is policy error. Awesome. When we spoke previously, you talked about the possibility of supply chain issues as well going forward. Can you talk me through a little bit of that? Yeah, so I think going into third quarter earnings for global market supply chain disruptions are going to be the biggest swing factor and potentially the biggest surprise in, in earnings. So you've had a couple things that happen. First of all, there's been the chip shortage in semiconductors, which has been going on for quite a while now. As I'm sure you know, during COVID, you had that whole pull forward of digitization because everybody was working from home and schooling from home and 
every single company in the world needed to go online very fast. So you had a big pull forward of digitization and that you know, had an incredible increase in the amount of demand for semiconductors. At the same time, you had a lot of um, you know, factories around the world that had to close because of COVID and you had a, a major supply demand imbalance. So that supply demand imbalance in semiconductors has been ongoing, even, even though a lot of countries have come out of COVID, that supply demand imbalance has never gotten back into balance since COVID. And that's still ongoing. I had a call last night with a German company called Infineon and you know, they're saying 2023 before that um, semiconductor supply demand imbalance is, is you know, back uh, in whack. The second thing that's happened more recently is more on the transportation side. So that, you know, there were some COVID outbreaks in China and they shut one of the major ports. Even if you shut a major port in China for two days, <laughs> that can have a, a major impact. You're seeing on the other side in the US, there are labor market issues where you can't find enough people to work at ports, you can't find enough warehouse space, you can't, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues on the other side. So as a result, you're getting significant backup in, um, in supply chains. And the combination of those two things, the semiconductors and the more logistics, uh, means that a lot of companies just can't get their goods, and that's going to, to have an impact on both sales and on costs in the second half of 2021. Okay, Mary, you've had some amazing mentors during your career. I was wondering if you could please share some of the lessons that you've learned from them so that investors can take these away and apply them to their own investment journeys. Yes, I have been lucky enough to have some, some amazing mentors. Um, as you may know, I, I started my career after business school uh, working at Soros Fund Management. And you know, while I wasn't in the office every day with, with George, he certainly was, um, was present and I, I learned a lot from working there. I think um, one thing I will say for investors is never stop learning. So if you, you've seen George, he's on TV, he's in his 80s now, and he's still talking about China and still talking about investments. And I mean, that's been like 60 years of, of learning about investment opportunities. And the thing that we all know about investments is that every opportunity is a learning opportunity. And so I would just you know, encourage your readers and your listeners to, to keep learning. It's why I mentioned the course I did before at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Learning because you know, I wanna learn more about sustainability and there's, there's lots of interesting things going on. So keep learning is number one. I think um, Howard Marks is, is someone that I know you, you um, often read his memos and people at Livewire are very clued into what he's saying. And I think for me, looking at, at um, sort of what Howard does with his memos, the power of writing things down is, is really important. So his memos are now famous and they're read by, by millions of people around the world. And the power of having that clarity of thought, which comes from writing things down and then thinking things through and having a record of how you were thinking and um, you know, how that played out, I think is very powerful. So I, I'm trying to emulate Howard in that respect. And Alfinity does a very good job with our internal technology systems of making sure you write it down. So this is my thesis and then this is what happened. So you know, for investors at home, just writing stuff down is, is, is a good idea. And then lastly, I mean, one, I'm, I've just recently joined Alfinity, but one of the things that I really love about the firm is that it's a co-PM model, you know, to be able to deliberate with your peers and debate things and have people who are very, very smart in investments and that you can talk to and throw ideas in a around. That's one of the things that I've learned from the people at Alfinity in the, in the early days of being there. And I would encourage your listeners and your readers to have a group like that, whether it's online and it's the people at Livewire, whether it's your friends or your, your colleagues, but having a group of people whose intellect you respect that you can talk to about stocks and investments, I think is, is really important. Well, thank you so much, Mary. I've absolutely loved talking to you today. Thank you again. Thanks so much for your time, Ali. It's been a pleasure.